you. Thank you. Right? We all know what this is, right? All right, now look, this week we're going to start a new series, and it's called With Room. Why? When I go to Starbucks, okay, which I'm pretty sure there'll be a Starbucks in heaven. I'm pretty, that sounds sacrilegious, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that it will be there. Um, I, I usually get the same thing. I usually get a grande pike. I usually get a grande pike with room. And then, so, so everybody knows it's a pike blend. It's their classic pike blend. Not that we need a Starbucks class. But, uh, and I'll drink. Technically, I'm not supposed to say I drink three or four of these a day. Stop with the, oh, my gosh, he's so unhealthy. Maybe. Listen, um, and I'll go, and I'll go, and I'll grande pike with room, but then I'll go over to the coffee bar, take the lid off, and then I'll fill it to the brim with all the goodies that are at the coffee bar. And now that it's colder, I might sprinkle a little chocolate there, a little cinnamon, just for the heck of it, because it's cheaper than getting a cinnamon dolce, whatever it is. You know what I mean? If, if, listen, if my grandfather knew that I was paying like three bucks for a cup of coffee, he would flip right now. He'd flip in the grave. He's flipping in the grave right now. <laughs> but the reality is, is what we do is we go and I'll get a grande pike a couple of times. People want to meet. So you got to meet. You got to go out in the community. I want to meet in an office. Sure, meet me at Starbucks. So we'll go. Uh, by the way, I don't know if I, I tweeted this earlier in the week. We shot a, a video that maybe some of you seen on the email. We got kicked out of a Starbucks because we shot a video in there. Is this not America? I don't, I'm, still a little, I'm still a little ticked about the whole thing, so I'm all right. Listen, I'll go to the coffee bar, and, there's, and I'll fill it to the brim. I'll fill it to the There's room in there. There's room, but I feel like if there's room, I, I need to... Make up the room. You don't want space in the cup. I, look, if I'm paying two fifty, three bucks for a cup of coffee, I'm going to get my money's worth. I'm going to fill it to the brim. And what happens a lot of times in our life, that's how we live. We have spots for room. We have spots for room, but we fill up our lives to the brim with things. I'm not even saying, ready, bad things, but I'm going to say this, even good things. But we fill it to the brim. And then we have no room to handle things that just come up, that just happen in life. So I want to talk about for the next couple of weeks, and I'm just going to say it right now. It's going to challenge everybody in this place, it just is. Because when we look at God's word, it's going to challenge the way we live, the way we think, all through the mechanism, all, all, always through love. But we live our lives to the brim. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 10. If you don't, there are Bibles in front of you, pull one of those out right in the back of the pews. And if for some reason you're having a hard time getting your hands on a Bible. Take that Bible, it's yours. We want you to have it as a gift, as a lovely gift. I would say parting gift, but we don't want you, we want you to come back. So it's not technically a parting gift. We thought about giving co- like coffee cards away today and everything, but not yet, not yet. Luke chapter 10, good story. What's uh, fascinating to me about this story in Luke chapter 10 is that it's, it's sandwiched it's four or five verses, and it's sandwiched between all of these other things that are going on happening. Now, I want to start all of us on the same page, all of us understanding what does with room mean? What does having room in our lives, living a life with room, space? I mean, we did it with the worship team. We're just creating some space. We're just creating some space for a little bit. Took away some things, drums, took away some keyboards. It shouldn't be that it's less than, it just should be that we've created space. And sometimes when you live life to the brim, creating space, all right, here we go. Who had coffee this morning? Raise your hand. Good. Here we go. Sometimes when we live life to the brim, as the norm, right to the tippy top, and something could make us spill over, when we create room, it feels a little awkward. It feels a little, it feels a little awkward. It feels a little like, 
Oh, that's weird. That's weird. That's it. Because it happens sometimes even in worship. We create a little space and we're not really singing a whole lot. We're just playing music and everybody, a lot of us might go, well, like, what are we doing? Like, what's going on? What's the next song? What are they doing? What it? And it's an intentional time to talk to God or, or actually have God talk to you. But I want to get to the definition, a working definition for the next couple of weeks that we all understand. What does it mean with room? What does it mean to live with room? It's the difference between what you have and what you need. That's life with room. If it takes me 30 minutes to get to Starbucks off East Lake Road from here, but I can make it in 20, I have 10 minutes of room. Here's something crazy. If it takes $1,500 a month to pay my bills, and I have $1,700 left over, what? Yeah, I'm going to use that word later. Let me say it again because it's in the Greek. It's, it's pronounced like this, left over, okay? It means that I have $200 of, if I have to be at a meeting at 1 o'clock, and I get to the meeting at 1250, I have 10 minutes of, room. When it's my mother's birthday, and one day before, it's her birthday, and she lives in another state, but the day before her birthday, I buy her a card, and it takes three days for the card to get there, guess what? I have no room. Not that we would ever happen in my house at all. And sure, if it did, I think my mom would let me know. (laughs) The difference between what you have and what you need is living life with room. Now, Luke chapter 10. Interesting story. It's sandwiched in between, like if you look, I just just want, I'm going to make this observation. It's fascinating to me. I mean, in Luke chapter 11, after this story, Jesus uh, teaches his disciples about prayer. He goes into his whole long thing about prayer. Beautiful passage. We've covered it before. That's after this story. Before the story, Jesus commissions 72 messengers to go, through, go, go out, and he commissioned them to do something. I mean, he's, he's rocking hard right now in ministry. He's giving people assignments. He's telling them to do things. He's teaching about prayer. He's teaching a parable. There's a parable in there. And then out of nowhere, out of nowhere, really, but all of a sudden there's this story There's just this little story right at the bottom of some of our Bibles about Mary and Martha. An exchange that happens between Jesus, Mary, and Martha. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. So Jesus is traveling. He has an agenda. He has somewhere to go. He stops. She opened up her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. All right, so here's the picture. I mean, Jesus is coming. She opens up her home like most of us do to family, friends, and if you're having friends you haven't had in a while, or you're having a prestigious friend, I mean, he is technically, I mean, Jesus, the rumor is he's the son of God, rumor is he's he's done a lot of miracles, I'm gonna open my home, trust me, I'm cleaning the toilet. I mean, I mean, if it's a friend that I'm with a lot and I see them, I mean, I'm gonna pick up around the house, but Jesus, yeah, Jesus, we use the good china. Yeah, Jesus, we wipe the counters down. We use Clorox bleach to get the coffee stains off the counter. I mean, we, we, might even, we might even vacuum. I mean, it's Jesus. Martha is getting preparations ready. I mean, she's got to get the house ready. I mean, this is a big deal. She opens her home, and he actually says yes. Okay, I'll come. And you can imagine, just my imagination. My life, We'd love to have you. And he goes, okay, no problem. She's like, oh, man. And she, <laughs> she goes. I mean, there's a lot that has to happen. Jewish tradition and custom, there were certain things that when you received a man of God, a prophet, there were certain things that you had to do in the home that, was very, that showed respect and grandeur and awe. But nonetheless, it would be just like us. I'm really good, China. I mean, it is, Jesus, son of man. 
I mean, I don't technically know if he's the son of man right now, Martha, maybe. But, I mean, Martha's saying, look, they say he is. I'm, I'm going to sweep the floor. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you kiss. She's running around making it happen. Jesus is there. She's doing everything to make his stay to make what he's doing, to make his absolutely, her, him being in her home just wonderful. She's running around the house making it all happen. What can I get you? Can I get you this? Can I do, can I do this? Let me sweep your feet. Can I? Do? She said, Lord, she speaks to Jesus in the house. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Seriously, do you see me running here? And Mary, and Mary's just kind of sitting there with Jesus, just talking. Could you imagine? Could you imagine having a guest in your home? You are running around making things happen. <laughs> and your husband or wife go, yeah, go ahead. So anyway, John, how you been? Look at the tension. Think of the look that you would get from a spouse. Running around everything. Hi, it's good to have you. And you're just running around making it. Just, I'm so glad you're here. I mean, I, and that's what we're talking about. Lord, you see me running around doing all of these things. Would you tell her to help me, please? Because it's about you, after all. Huh. Tell her to help me. And then the Lord answers, Martha, Martha. <laughs> Whenever the Lord calls your name twice like that, I don't know. I don't know. It's just weird. It's just like. Hey, Mark! You don't ever hear it in a positive, do you? Hey, Mark, Mark, how are you? No. Mark, Mark. <laughs> Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing. That's why I love the word of God. Every word is exactly in the right place, and every word that's not there is not supposed to be there, and every word that's there is supposed to be there. You are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Lord, come on, I'm doing all this, stuff. seriously. It's about you, help, tell, her to help, tell her to get up. Tell her to get up and at least roll out the silverware. Martha, Martha. Relax, chillax, relax a little bit. You're worried, you're running around, you're worried about a lot of things. There's only one thing that's needed. There's only, there's only one thing that is needed. Mary has chosen what is better and what not, will not be taken from her. Here we go. You guys ready? You guys pumped up? Enough caffeine? A life with room? Huh. Look at this, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? In our lives, we run at such a frantic pace. A frantic pace. We fill our lives, even when we have room, we fill our lives with stuff. Appointments, phone calls, emails, Twitter, Facebook, and our life is constantly filled when we find or we try to find room and we try to sit still just to relax or reflect. Having room in our lives can look like maybe several nights a week at home to do nothing. Having room in our lives could mean having the emotional capacity to handle surprises in life instead of so filled to the brim and so tense that when our son or daughter drop a glass of milk, an accident, maybe a careless accident, we don't flip. That's what I mean by emotional capacity, having room for emotional capacity. When you haven't checked the battery in your car in years, your car is 18 years old, it's 106 degrees out, your air conditioning is kind of blowing cold, but it's really not, and you're on 54, and you're in dead man zone where there's nothing, and the battery goes dead because for some reason you shut the car off to get gas, and you went to go get gas, not that it would ever happen to me or anything like that, and, and you don't absolutely have a meltdown because of a battery that you haven't checked in probably 11 years. Having the emotional capacity with room could mean that you have the emotional capacity to handle stuff that comes up in life. With, with room in our lives 
could mean that we live in such a way that we have enough money to help one another. Or we have enough money at the end of the month to give to a charity or an organization or a missionary to make a difference outside of a seven mile radius of our own lives. With room could mean that you're able to sit. Here we go. With room could mean that you're able to sit and not be a producing human being, but just be a human being. I'm going to say it again. Emotional room, having room in our lives could mean that you can sit and enjoy sitting and enjoy talking to God, enjoy hearing from God, enjoy a relationship with God, and not producing. That, 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 that's what with room looks like in our lives. Martha, running around, Jesus is in the house. We gotta make things happen. Lord, seriously, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. When we talk about this subject, the difference between what you have and what is needed is with room. When we talk about this subject, we're gonna be convinced that the way or the pace in which we live is right. This is gonna be difficult because some of us in the room are gonna go, yeah, whatever, I'll slow down for a couple of days and go right back into it. Martha was convinced how she was running around, how she was just going nuts, how she was getting everything ready, she was convinced she was right. She was so convinced that what she was doing was so right. Lord, seriously, can't you tell Mary to help me? I mean, look at what I'm doing here. I'm making this event for you great. I'm making you feel comfortable. I'm making you feel good, warm, and welcome in my home. She was convinced that the way and the pace at which she was living and what she was doing was right. And for years, we've convinced ourselves the same thing. That producing makes us valuable. That producing makes us valuable. Isn't it funny? Isn't it just funny that Paul, in the book of Romans, he says, do not be conformed to this world. And we think, that's right, those sinners, those people, don't be conformed to them. They're awful. They're bad. Look at all the bad things they're doing. There is an actual ancient Jewish saying that we have adapted over the years in Americana and in Western civilization. If the devil can't make you bad, he'll just make you busy. And so what happens is when we're going to talk about this, having room in our lives morally, having room in our lives relationally, having room in our lives financially. People are convinced now the way I'm going, yeah, I'm a little crazy. It's a little crazy for me, but I'm good. I mean, just like Martha. Convinced that the pace at which she was, and the things that she was doing, they were right. So right that, Lord, don't you need to just tell her something? Don't you just need to tell her to join me in what I'm doing? Next scripture. Martha, Martha, the Lord answers. You are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better. Here's the idea. The choice to live life with room is ours. Well, Pastor Q, you don't understand. I mean, after all, you only work one day a week. <laughs> Therapy has allowed me to say that. And the reason why I can say that is because that's some of the stuff I've heard back. Come on, you only work one day a week, and even that, you don't work a full day, you're done by 12. You don't understand. No. The choice is ours to live with room. The choice is ours to live with room. Mary chose. 
do you notice that Jesus never gave Mary direction to go join the sister? Do you notice that Jesus never told Martha, you're right. Hey, Mary, maybe you should get up and maybe you should get up and at least help with the tablecloth. I mean, look, okay, don't go crazy like she does, but go ahead and do the toilet. And then just come back, come back, let her do her thing, but then come back and talk. No. I love what the word says. She chose. Mary chose. And when we're talking about adapting a life, I'm not, listen, I'm telling you, it's challenging. This is going to challenge you to understand what life is supposed to be. Do not be conformed, Paul says, because we live in a society where you're more successful if you accumulate. That's your measure, and I'm not saying accumulating is wrong. I'm saying if that's all you're doing is accumulating and not living it horizontally with others in need and with people and giving back to God what is his, listen, she chose. She chose. Well, you don't understand. I've got this and my. This is what. This, I'm just going to tell a story. Maybe I shouldn't tell it, but I'll tell it and then see what kind of fallout there is. And then I'm talking, I'm talking to a family this week. I think they go to the 11, so I think we're safe. I'll tell a different story at 11. All right, look. And, and, and we're just meeting and we're sitting and they're just, they're just going through some things. They're just going through some stuff. We all go through stuff. It's not more spiritual. Not, I, I haven't seen you guys. I haven't seen you guys. I haven't seen you. Well, we're just talking, you know. And this is their church. They come here. But, but I haven't seen you. I haven't seen you. What is, what is it? What is, oh, we just get busy. We heard that. But we've heard that. Where you been? I'm oh, just busy. So you, what do I mean, what, what, doesn't it, what, I don't understand, I'm trying to understand, we choose, we choose whether we come to church or not, we choose, well, I mean, we just choose, I mean, let's just be grown up about it, we just choose, everybody sitting here at nine o'clock, they chose, we chose to say, I'm going to make room for God's house and God's people, that's it, we chose, so we have the ability to choose, our chooser is off because sometimes we choose things living life to the brim. The choice is ours just like it was Mary's. Watch this. Mary has chosen what is better. So, so if you say Mary chose what is better, to sit and to be with God Jesus here, to be, that means something else was okay or something else was good, but this was better. When we historically read this story, we think that Martha was distracted by sin, by bad things. She, she was, Martha was so occupied, Martha was distracted with the good things. See, we think, oh, that's right, sit at the Lord's feet, sit, da, da. but reality is both of them, both women, here we go, Martha and Mary, both of them, had the same opportunity for an experience with Jesus. They both had the same potential and the same chance, the same opportunity for an experience with Jesus. But Martha became distracted by the good things Mary chose the better. It says, Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken from her. Martha was distracted by the good things. She was distracted by the good things from the best things. And sometimes when we live our lives to the brim they're not always to the brim because our behavior is horrible. Oh, not always live to the brim with all of this sinful stuff. We live to the brim because we don't know how to choose between what is good and what is best. And we're going to touch on that in the weeks to come. But understand, Martha was not distracted by bad. She was distracted by the good 
you could say it like this. Saying yes to the best things means saying no to the good things. You know why? It's good. It's good to make somebody feel welcome in your home, Martha. It's good to make Jesus feel like he's family. To make him feel comfortable, yes it is. But if I had a choice and sitting at the master's feet and rolling out the good china, I'm gonna sit with Jesus. See, saying yes to the best things means saying no to the good. And we miss that a lot of times in this story. And we live life to the brim. And for some of us, it is filling it to the brim with things that are inappropriate and things that are not good for our behavior, that are not good for our relationship with Christ. But some of us live life to the brim and we're stressed and we're crazy and we're not garnering what we can get out of the best things because it's filled with the good things. And saying yes to the best means saying no to the good. Now, this is just week one. We're gonna have 31 weeks of this just kidding. Martha lived with no room. I gotta go. I gotta get this going. I gotta go. This is, oh, he's gonna love this. I'm, I'm, I'm baking something. This is gonna be great. This is gonna, oh, the, he's gonna love this. I'm gonna put out the, I'm gonna put out this. And then he's, when he walks in and he's here and he sees this, it's gonna be nice. He's gonna feel totally distracted with the good for what the best is. One thing, Jesus said, only one thing. Martha is living a life with no room. When you live a life with no room, no room, your stress increases. When you live a life with no room, your stress increases. Everything, you know, how, how many times have we heard this? I grew up hearing this, don't make a mountain out of a molehill. All we do is go from mountain to mountain, and it's just nothing but a bump and a molehill. But because we live with no room, our, we are stressed. We are stressed. And the littlest thing stresses us out and causes us to spill over. When you live a life with no emotional room, when you live a life with no room, you're stressed. You're stressed. Perfect example. How long does it take you to relax? Don't answer. I'll answer for you. I'll answer for me. If I go on a five-day vacation, it takes me three days to relax. I got one day down, and then at the end of that day, I got to ramp up because I only got one day left to be back at work. Stress. Because I have lived with no room. When you live with no room, your stress increases. That's Martha. Martha lived with no room. Listen, and this is very important. Her relational intimacy, her relational intimacy suffered. When you're stressed, I'll talk about me. When I'm stressed, there's a lot of, thing that, a lot of things that happen. But I'm so stressed, I don't want to be around people. But I'm a pastor. So it's like going, I want to be a doctor, but I hate blood. <laughs> I want to be in the medical field, but, but I mean the whole thing and tubes and people's, yeah, what? <laughs> Wait, imagine being a pastor not liking people. <laughs> Wait, ima imagine me, and some of us are going, I know guys like that. Wait, wait, listen, <laughs> imagine being a pastor and not what, and what happens is, what happened with Martha is she's doing all the good stuff but her intimate relationship with Jesus suffered because she felt compelled that she had to get everything ready and everything just right and everything. She had to run from the good to the good to the good to the good and she left out the best. What hurt? Her intimacy with her father. And if you break it down to five feet, when you're stressed and you're running around, from one maybe good thing to another, or you're running around just because you gotta feel filled to the brim so that you feel successful or valued, you will never, ever garner the benefit of a true friend. You will never garner the benefit of a true relationship. When you're sitting 
you're trying to engage with a family member, parents, and you're trying to engage with your spouse, and they're tweeting, and they're Facebooking, and they're texting, you're not getting the most out of that relationship. You're not. They didn't have Twitter back in the Bible. They didn't have Facebook back in the Bible. Oh, what they had was just people running around feeling like their value was going from one good thing to another. But today, maybe it's not, maybe, maybe it's not today, maybe it's not running home to prepare for Jesus because he's coming over for coffee and cake, but maybe today it's, and our relationships are suffering. And our relationships are suffering. Simple way, if you have children, it's a simple, simple thing here. Um, I've gotten emails before about, and this is a little side. Side note, this is an extra. It's like getting an extra shot, okay, of, of, of espresso in your coffee. Just a little extra. I've gotten emails saying, what do we do? Facebook is evil. You know, Facebook is the devil. Satan's, you know, 666 is going to come out of Facebook. You know, the whole, no, it's actually not. If you want a simple way to monitor what your children do, because you have to be in the world but not of it. Don't get me started, it's a whole other sermon. Listen to me. If you want a simple way to help your kids with media, get all their passwords and say, no, you can go on. And you can look at their Facebooks whenever you want, and you can go on to Facebook. Go ahead. Now I know when you're on it, and I, now I know how long you have it, how long you're on it. Simple, simple way. It's what we do in our house. It's what we do. I, so here it is. I, now, oh, you want to get on? Sure, here it is. Here's the password. Now I know how long they're on. Now I can go check it whenever I want. Simple. Sidebar. Back to the sermon. Here we go. Her relational intimacy suffered. And that's what happens. When we... <laughs> squirrel! <laughs> <laughs> Where's Pastor Dave? Where is he? <laughs> so everybody knows, Pastor Dave's nickname in the office is Squirrel. Hey, Pastor Cuda! What? what? Finish the sentence, bro! Whatever. <laughs> Good Lord. This is where we're going to end up. This is where we're going to end up when we're done. All of us. No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. That's where we're going to end up when we're done with this series with room. The difference between what you need and what you have. And what I have found in my life, for me, when I live without room and I fill it to the brim, it's really an issue of faith. It's really an issue of faith. I'm going to work that extra because I got to have all of these things and I don't know that if I don't do this, I don't know, I don't have enough faith that the Lord's going to provide. And I'm not saying, guys, sitting in the living room in a lazy boy waiting for money to come in to pay the electric bill. That's not what I'm talking about. You got to go do the work. We know that. But really what it comes down to, when I find myself being the Martha running around and making it happen, I'm looking for some kind of approval. I'm looking for somebody to look at me and go, wow, boy, I'll tell you what, he's really, when I find myself being Martha, going from the good to the good to the good, back in the day it was the bad, the bad, good, the bad, the bad, good. It really, I'm just trying to fill some void I'm just trying to fill some void in my life and I'm occupying that time because I'm not comfortable either being in the presence of a father that really loves me or I'm not comfortable being alone with my own thoughts. So I just fill it and I just fill it to the brim. And I wasn't really understanding that a life 
Following Christ is more about what you're becoming than what you are right now. That living a life of Christ, following Christ, is more and more day after day, hour after hour, week after week, month after month, of knowing that he will guide me, that he will provide, that I do my part, God will always do his. Living a life with room. Ooh, it's stretchy a little bit, isn't it? A little stretch, stretch, little stretches out, man. My expectation for everybody in this room is that when we're done, we're gonna make radical life changes. Because if it was a moderate change, like, oh yeah. Okay, I'll leave Thursdays open. Thursday nights, all right, I'll leave. If, if that was the case, everybody in this room is smart in some way, shape, or form. You would have done that already. But we live it to the brim and we're stressed and we're detached and we're displaced and we're never fully present. We're never fully present with one another and we're never fully present with the Lord. Be still, Psalm says. Be still and know that you're God. No. Everybody went, what? Yeah, be still and know that I am God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, right now, um, Lord, for some of us, Lord, we, we've never known, we've never known that you were there to guide, to protect, to restore, to strengthen. Lord, and today, there are people in this room, Lord, that right now are going to make a commitment for the first time, Lord, to understanding and knowing, to understanding and knowing that you are God and we are not. Lord, today in this room, there are people for the first time, for the first time, are going to come into a relationship with you. They've never heard They've never heard that you love them, that we were built for worship and relationship. They've never heard that we will be like a tree planted next to a spring, and you will provide, and you will restore, and you will strengthen our frame. Lord, I pray for those people right now, that for the first time, they're, gonna, they're going to live a different lifestyle. They're going to live life with fun and acceptance and a full life, but they're going to make room for the best things. Lord, they're gonna make room for the best things. They're gonna set aside the good so they have room for the best. Setting aside the good and making room for the best. Lord, I wanna pray for those right now that for the first time, they're accepting your love, your grace, they're accepting your forgiveness. Lord, for the first time, they're realizing they were meant to have a relationship with you. Lord, I'm praying for those right now. Let's keep our heads bowed. If you're saying that for the first time, just repeat this prayer after me. Lord, I love you. Lord, I need a savior. Lord, teach me your ways. Lord, show me your ways. I want to follow you. Thank you, Lord, that the cross was meant for everyone. That the cross and your sacrifice and your crucifixion, your death meant to everybody gets forgiveness. Lord, this week, Lord, this week teach us to set aside the good to show us what's best. Lord, bring us back together next week so we can continue to learn from your word. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Hey guys, our prayer team is up front. Would love for you to take a moment, maybe create some room and have some of our prayer team pray over you for something so that they can pray for you throughout the week. Amen? See you guys next week.